Hey friends, welcome back uh, to our study of Revelation. I was looking on my notes, this is our 32nd lesson. So we've been doing this a lot and I am glad that you have hung in there and you're still with us uh, today. So we're gonna begin the 18th chapter of Revelation, one that is gonna stick with you. Promise, it's gonna stick with you. And as we do with each study, uh, let's ask for God's blessings as we, uh, as we embark on this. So let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your word uh, that you give us. Thank you for the privilege that we have to uh, study it and discuss it, try to figure out what it means. And I want to thank you also for the challenge that it brings uh, for us to live it out. It's one thing to know it. It's an entirely different level uh, to become obedient to it and replicate it in the way that we live. And I think we'll find that out on our study this evening in uh, Revelation 18. So please place a blessing upon those who hear the words, um, guide the things that I say, and I, I pray that your your influence, your power goes far beyond our ability to speak or hear, that there's an anointing from your spirit and that you would accomplish your work in this study. So thank you again for the privilege. Now bless our time together. And we humbly ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, um, Revelation 18, 1 through 24. Uh, this chapter is very unique. It's, it's, a, it's a different chapter. And what makes it unique is that it kind of has uh, two different sides to it that we're going to talk about. One side, I refer to it kind of as the specific nature of the chapter. And then the other side is a more general nature. So you're going to hear me talk about both of those a lot, specific and general. And when I'm talking about the specific nature of the chapter, I'm, I'm talking about that that word specific means to be very narrow focused. It means to be like pinpointed on one thing. Um, I will often refer to it as a rifle approach rather than a shotgun approach. It's kind of a specific approach to a text in scripture is kind of the center of a bullseye. And so when you open up chapter 18, um, if you've been with us, you know that we're on the sixth section of the book out of seven sections. So we're getting toward the end and we're starting to see how this battle of good and evil, the final victory of this is going to come to play and good is going to defeat evil. God is going to defeat Satan. So we've been kind of moving that way and now we're in the sixth section. We're kind of getting there. And you know that when John gets toward the end of this, uh, you know that he's been doing a lot of talking about uh, imagery of beast and a dragon. And, and by now, you can interpret that uh, yourself. Satan is the dragon, and that Satan will manifest himself as we move along through history through these anti-God uh, governmental culture and forces and entities and the leaders of those redeem of, of those regimes and they are the beast so in this particular section the section uh, six as we get near the end we find the battle of good over these images of dragon and beast and uh, we know they replicate themselves throughout history satan just keeps replicating himself through different beasts but for the readers of this chapter here's where the specific nature of this comes in for the original readers of the book of revelation those Christians who were parts of those seven churches told to us in chapters two and three, real Christians, real churches, the, the original readers, they looked at chapter 18 with a specific lens because the beast was Rome. It was Rome. And so when they're reading this chapter, they know that the 18th chapter specifically talks about the destruction of Rome. 
And, and you know as well that when John writes this, he uses Babylon as a code word for Rome. And, and so the reason I mention all that is because the first century Christian reader of this letter, chapter 18 may have been their favorite letter or favorite chapter in the whole book. Be, because they are dealing right now with the influence of evil Rome, and they're going to read in the 18th chapter that the number one agent of enemy who's bringing havoc in their life is going to be destroyed. And so that that's what I want you to know about chapter 18 is that it does have this very specific focus to the original readers, Rome is going to be destroyed. Now, in, in light of the specific nature of the chapter, there is also, outside of the specificity of, of Rome, there is outside of that a general nature. There, is, there are principles about how Rome will be defeated that will apply to all representatives of the beast and, and all representatives of evil throughout all of history. And so you and I right now, we look at the chapter in more of a general approach. So I, I want you to kind of catch that. I know I'm kind of beating, uh, beating that dead horse here, but I, I want you to understand that although we won't have the urgency and the thrill of the first century readers when they were hearing that Rome was going to be destroyed, we will have this, this ecstatic um, hope, confident hope of the future that the way Rome went down is the same way that all representations of the beast will go down throughout history. So that's the uniqueness of chapter 18 is the specific approach toward Rome and the general approach toward the representation of the beast throughout history. Now, with all that said, uh, let's go ahead and read this chapter. It is one of the longest chapters in the book. It's not the longest, but it's in, I don't know, the top two or three longest. So it's going to take us a while, but I want us to read all 24 verses of the 18th chapter. And so if you have a Bible, it will help immensely for you to follow along and not get lost as I read it. But if you don't, just try to to zero in in here and focus. So Revelation 18, uh, starting in verse 1. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority. The earth was illuminated by his splendor. And with a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries." And then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she's done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as queen. I'm not a widow and I will never mourn. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her, terrified at her torment. They will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power. In one hour your doom has come. 
The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages and bodies and and souls of men. They will say the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished and never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment, and they will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe, O great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin." And every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of a burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? And they will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she's been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God had judged her for the way she treated you. And then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it in the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpets will never be heard in you again. No workman of any trade will ever be found in you. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's great men by your magic spell and all all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and have all been killed on the earth. Man, what a chapter. What an absolute chapter. So here's how I want to tackle it. We could literally spend a few lessons on all the imagery in there, but what I want to do with you, I, I just kind of want to tease this chapter a little bit. I want to look at the specific part of it and the general part of it. That's why I wanted to explain that. And I'm going to show two things regarding the specific nature of the destruction of Rome. And then I want to talk about three general principles about God's destruction of the representation of the beast throughout history. So, Two specific and three general. Let's jump into the specific nature of chapter 18. Now, here's the first point in the specific category I want you to talk about. And if you take notes, write this down. Rome will be completely destroyed. That's the specific lesson that the original readers heard. Early in that chapter, in the second verse, John writes, "'Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great.'" And, and you know now, Babylon is code for Rome. And so the Christians were being told here in no uncertain terms that their number one demonic enemy is going to be destroyed. Now, it is written in what is called an aorist tense. And uh, I'm actually using that in a sermon that I'm coming up with on next weekend, talking about the same thing. And I've always referred to the the aorist tense as past tense on steroids, okay? And, and so what John is doing when he does that, he's saying when Rome goes down, she will never resurface, never. Now, you and I know that the beast... Representation of the beast is going to replicate himself throughout history. 
and there will be another evil regime after Rome and one after that one and after that one. And you and I can think about that. We've done these in these lessons. Who are all the representation of evil culture forces in the world who oppose God? I mean, there's, there's many of those. But for these Christians, this is the specific nature of it. These Christians reading this near the end of the first century, they weren't thinking about the replication of the beast. They were thinking about Rome because Rome is what they were dealing with. And, 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 and John comes out and wants them to know that Rome is going to be completely destroyed. Now, in our English translations, when it says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, you'll notice that it has an exclamation point at the end of each of that. Now, that is not in the original language. It doesn't use exclamation points here. Um, English versions do that. And I, I kind of want to talk about how that probably came about. Um, when English translations are, are completed in the Bible, these are incredibly intelligent, wise, unbelievably smart men and women who know the original language, know the Bible, and they, they interpret these verses. And I can see them looking at this phrase, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, and they know it's past tense on steroids. John's trying to say, listen, Rome is gone forever. And I can see him sit around the table now. Now, how can we say that? How can we put it so everybody gets it in the English? This is, and somebody just, how about we use exclamation points? And everybody goes, yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. And they put these exclamation points in there. This is over for Rome. Now, if you kind of think about it in the eyes of a first century person reading that, they know about this, man. They know about this. Uh, we've talked in this lesson about the persecution of those believers by the emperor Nero, who saw Christianity as a threat to his re regime. And, and so he made, made sport of them and killed them and persecuted them. And, and those people who went through that, these people reading it, they were their friends, man. That was their family. They, they, they saw those people fed to lions in arenas. And so when they read that Rome is over forever, I mean, it was just ecstatic to them. We, we could go all the way back and even talk about the person who was writing this, John. And if we went back to the introduction of this book, you know, 32 lessons ago, we talked about John was, was cast on the island of Patmos as a punishment for being a Christian. And I read back then a description from the historian Pliny who wrote about what Patmos was like. So I, br I brought that back. Let me read it again. Pliny wrote in his historical account of that, that small island, he said, the prisoners were thrown together into any ship that could be found, and such as escaped the dangers of the waves and storms reached the place for their habitation. They found there nothing but bare rocks and an inhospitable rugged shore where they had to pass a life of hardship and misery. See, that's where John is when he's writing this. That's going on with John because of Rome. And so when he writes with specificity, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Fallen, fallen is Rome. Man, he writes it in bold print. That's a powerful, powerful point to know there. John is telling these people the current manifestation of the beast is over. It is final. It is complete. Uh, you probably read my influxure to my voice when he talked about never again will the city experience music, business transactions will not happen. Uh, remember that when the malls went dead during COVID? That's what we're seeing here. Lights of festivals, weddings, none of it will ever happen again in Rome. So these Christians read that with ecstatic joy. Now, that, that kind of leads to the second specific point that I want you to understand in regards to the lenses of a first century Christian, and that is the celebration of heaven over the demise of Rome. So Rome goes down and heaven will celebrate that. Now, I want you to watch this because I, I think this is so powerful. Um, it, it shows how this book is so beautifully woven together. 
The last verse of chapter 18 talks about the blood of prophets and saints were found in that city. And you wonder why John brings that up at the end of this chapter, that yeah, Christians were killed in your city. Why, why does he bring that out? Well, it requires us in our mind to go all the way back in to chapter 6, many, many, many lessons ago. And when we were in chapter 6, John included a statement about saints who had been killed. And so we see there in chapter 18, okay, they were, they were killed in Babylon, code word Rome. Rome killed those Christians. We go back to chapter 6, and John gave us a picture of those Christians while they were in heaven. Their souls were in heaven. And he told us back in chapter 6, and I said at that point, I said, I think this is the core of the book. I think this is a center point of the book in chapter 6, verse 10, because we were allowed to look into heaven and see Christians, their souls in heaven before Jesus comes back, and we see what they're doing in heaven. And what they're doing in chapter 6, verse 10, is they are asking God, when are you going to get even? When are you going to even the score over evil that destroyed us? Chapter 6, verse 10 says, they, who's they? The souls of Christians are calling out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? So we see all that in chapter 6. God, when are you going to end this thing? When are you going to end this thing? And now we're all the way at the chapter 18. We're at the end of chapter 18. And God answers the prayer of the souls in chapter 6. In chapter 6, they prayed for God to end this thing, and God finally does it in chapter 18 through the destruction of Rome. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the next time we come back in our next lesson, we're going to be in chapter 19. Let me just read for you the first verse in chapter 19. After this, after what? The destruction of Rome. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? They were crying in chapter 6. And they're praising God in chapter 19 because God answered their prayer and destroyed Rome. He destroyed the beast. Now, that's kind of the specific nature. And there's more of that stuff we could dive into. I just did that to kind of whet your appetite through the eyes of a first century Christian reading this. Rome is going to lose and all of heaven is going to break out in praise. Now, in addition to that, there are these general principles about the destruction of Rome that are as applicable today as they were back then as you and I deal with evil as you and I deal with the replication of the beast and the way he attacks uh, Christianity and the saints of God throughout years. So you and I are still in the battle. We know that, and there are general principles that come up. And here's one of them I want you to see. I'm going to talk about three of them. It is the undeniable fact that as history moves along, as we go along in history, evil the force of evil will garner enormous support. Evil will increase. Many times we find in the book where John is saying that there are all sorts of people who are following Rome. I want to read some of those again. Chapter 18, verse 3, he said, all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. She has influence on all the nations. 
Revelation 18, verse 9. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her shared her luxury and see the smoke of her burning, they weep and mourn over her. All kinds of kings and forces in the world have been allured by Rome slash Babylon. Verses 17 and 19 in the 18th chapter. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship and the sailors and all who learn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like like this great city, and they will throw dust on their heads with weeping and mourning and cry out. All these people who are mourning the loss of evil. And what John is trying to tell us is that evil, as it advances in time, will garner more and more and more and more support. Evil will increase. Now, I've been fortunate enough, God has allowed me to teach this book in its entirety a few times in various settings throughout my uh, ministry. I think each time I do it, I, I probably maybe understand a little bit more and change my views on a few things when I dive into it. But I always love coming back and running into somebody who said, hey man, I, I went through that study uh, with you 15 years ago or you know, 20 years ago, I remember hearing that. And I, I love to hear people's perceptions who went through the Revelation study a long time ago to see, did anything stick with them? Do they still remember something years and years later? And one of the things that often come up in conversations with people who talk to me years later is they remember the idea that evil will increase increase over time. They remember that. It's just going to get bigger and bigger, and the force of evil is going to get stronger and stronger over time. And the reason they see that is because they live it. How many times in the last, I mean, year or two, have you said to somebody, I never dreamed in all my life this stuff would be happening? What's happening? Evil's just getting bigger and intensifying and getting bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. And that doesn't mean that we ought not still fight for right and hold on to the truth of God. We need to. We need to hang out. But don't ever be fooled with the idea that somehow we're going to turn the tide and everything's going to be perfect. That will not happen until heaven. That won't happen until heaven. And so as evil is increases... Man, we have to stay the course on good so that it doesn't totally wipe us out. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7, <coughs> excuse me, Matthew chapter 7, if you're writing down notes, verses 13 and 14, he said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. What was Jesus saying is as we go along in history, evil gets bigger and stronger and more and more corrupt. So my encouragement is that you don't ever get caught up in majority opinion. Don't worry so much about majority opinion. It feels good when majority opinion believes in godly principles. And that happens once in a while. It really does. But don't be surprised when it doesn't. Don't be surprised when majority opinion stands with things that are wrong and evil. That's going to happen. Evil is going to become more and more supported by more and more people as we near the end of time. And I don't like that message. I don't like that message. But remember the old adage, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, right? The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Now, here's a second kind of general application that uh, John used for the original readers, but it applies as we go throughout history, and it really applies uh, to you and I, and it's a bit confrontational. So I'm going to, uh, one of my friends, I'm going to get under your grill a little bit here, okay, this. So check this out. As the influence of evil increases, the people of God, you and me, must become intentional and passionate about separating ourselves from the influence of that evil. So evil gets bigger and bigger. You and I have to be careful that we don't get caught up in that. 
We have to be careful with that. When I was studying this, I remembered a lesson that I had in Bible college a million years ago. Um, but man, I can still remember that. All these years that I remember this professor talking about that. And he was describing how in our Bible college that we attended, how they placed people, students together in dorms. So you had a roommate and they, they said, here's how we do that. And I remember the professor saying that sometimes they assigned uh, roommates in a particular way. They may have a student who was maybe somewhat problematic and maybe somewhat immature in their faith, and they would take that person and team them up with someone who is very mature in their faith. And their idea was that if we can kind of get the weak with the strong, then the strong will influence the weak, and the weak will then become strong. So if you put evil in the same bucket of good, then good will influence evil, and evil will then become good. So put a bad kid with a good kid, and you end up with two good kids. And they said that was kind of their strategy, but then he told us this. He said, we are learning that that doesn't work. That was... That was fascinating to me. I still remember that. He said, in most cases, what we learn after a semester or so, the problematic student had more negative influence on the mature student. And so good was being influenced by evil. And so you ended up with two good students. You ended up with two bad students. And I remember him saying the lesson that they were learning was that in most cases, evil influences good much easier than good influences evil. That is fascinating to me. And that's the whole point of the fourth verse in chapter 18. And John says this, that God makes this statement, come out of her, my people. Now, who's her? Rome, Babylon, evil, manifestation of the beast, come out of her. And what he's talking is that Christians were buying in to the evil system of that day. They were getting caught up in that. And he said, come out of her. Now, he's obviously not saying, I want you to leave Rome. That wasn't God's point there. He was saying, though, that even though you are in Rome, it doesn't mean you have to be of Rome. And that's not a new thought in the book of Revelation at all. In the Old Testament, Israel would occupy a new land. And uh, if you know much about the Old Testament, when they came in and occupied these lands, God forbid them, don't intermarry with the native people there. And some people look at that and say, see, that's proof right there that, that different races are not supposed to marry each other. That's not even close to the meaning of the text. God said, I don't want you to marry them because you'll end up adopting their false gods and their false practices, and they will lead you away from me. So evil will influence good. So don't, don't get caught up in that. I went all the way back into my introductory lesson of Revelation when I was writing this one, and um, I made the statement back then that some people get interested in the book, and they want to study the book of Revelation because they are curious about how future events are going to come about. You know, how's the world going to end, and when is Jesus going to come back, and what's going to happen to people at the end if you're still on this earth? And people get all caught up in um, a curiosity of the future. And I don't want to say the book doesn't deal with that because the book does deal with that a little bit, but that is not the purpose of the book. The purpose of Revelation is not to satisfy our curiosity about the future, but it is to instill faithfulness in the people of God that you cannot be enticed and allured by the growing influence of evil. See, I think that is the, capital V, capital V modern application of this book. As we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus, saints cannot be enticed and allured 
to abandon the truths of God and buy into the lies and deception of the dragon and his beast that is gaining in popularity. And gang, you don't have to have two cents of smarts to you to know that's happening right now. It's not just an evil culture that you and I are living in that is becoming more and more intense. It is the saints of God who are being deceived and allured into that culture. And that's the message of the book of Revelation. Don't let that happen to you. And again, it's not, it's not seclusive only to the book of Revelation. I'm going to read for you a text from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And uh, again, I'm just going to read it real quick. If you want to look at it, great. If not, just write down verses 14 through 17. And I, I want to read this, and you'll see it's talking about what, what I just talked about. He said this, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I'll be their God and they'll be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, there are people who take 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and say that means Christians are not to marry non-Christians and they use that as their proof text. Now, um, there's, there's wisdom in that. There really is. If you're a person of faith, I don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers, but if you're a person of faith, before you fall into love with somebody, tell your kids this, before you fall into love with somebody, make sure they're a person of faith as well, just like you. But that scripture is not a specific mandate about marriage. That's not what he's talking about. Marriage is an application to it, but the principle is way broader than marriage. What we're talking here is that Christians should exercise extreme caution in any relationship where they will be influenced to move away from Christ. And that doesn't mean you're not supposed to have non-Christian friends. That's not what that means. We need non-Christian friends so that we can influence them. But when you're in those circles and you're, you're part of those circumstances where, where it is good and, and evil together, understand you are walking in the enemy's camp. And you must resolve that good is going to influence evil, not evil influence good. So this isn't a sermon. This, the purpose of this is to motivate people. But I want to be a, a little motivation, a little confrontation with you here just for a second. So think about any relationships you have that are not relationships of faith, okay? And I hope you have some. Uh, we, we need those to influence the world. But I want to ask you, are you influencing them toward good or are they influencing you toward evil? That's a big, big important question. And the general truth presented to us in Revelation 18 is be extremely cautious about that. Now, one more general principle, um, and I've written it this way. Extremism in sin leads to extremism in judgment. Now, let's put some, some teeth in that. In our court system in America, m most of us know this, there's a wide variety of punishments that we have that fit particular crimes. So if a misdemeanor is committed, it might be a fine or community service or probation, something like that. When you get into the felony area, it, it might be talking imprisonment. And imprisonment might be a few months. It might be a lifetime. There are some states where the ultimate punishment is the, the capital uh, sentence of death. So, so we're used to this idea that uh, the degree 
of crime is attached to the degree of punishment. We, we kind of understand that. But have you ever thought in terms of that relating to our spiritual accountability to God? In other words, are there degrees of punishment that God has for people who commit various degrees of sin? You wonder about that. And so we know that if you live a life of sin without becoming a Christian, we know that the punishment of that is hell. But are there punishments of degrees in hell? And you might be surprised that the Bible tends to at least hint at that. So if we go back to the 6th and 7th verses, it says this. Give back to her, who's her? Rome, okay? Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she's done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. Now, we're talking about God punishing Rome, and Rome has attempted to end the presence of Christianity in her early years, and uh, Rome persecuted Christians, made life miserable for them, even killed them as sport, and now they're going to be punished, and they're going to receive a double portion of punishment. That's what it says. So it, it appears that what we're hearing is that extreme sin leads to extreme punishment. So are there degrees of punishment in hell? Now, there's a couple different views on this. I'll tell you both views. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know, I don't know which view is right. I, I couldn't even tell you if either one is right. These are the two predominant views. We just don't know enough in Scripture to make that, um, that, that determination. Here's one view, and that is that there really are differing stages of intensity of punishment in hell. It really is. And I'm being facetious here, but but let's say the thermostat of everyone's bedroom in hell is set at 1,000 degrees. But if you've been extreme with sin in your life, maybe your thermostat is set at 10,000 degrees. Well, that's silly, but you're kind of catching the point here. And we don't have a lot of biblical discussion about it. Um, so if this is kind of where you land on it, that there are degrees of punishment, it's it's kind of speculation at best. The second interpretation or view of that is that the double portion is referring, referring to the consequences of sin here on this earth. So if you are extreme with sin, you will suffer consequences of that here on this earth and in hell. So you kind of have this, this double thing going. And uh, here, here's an example. The Bible says that adulterers and drunkards will not go to heaven. Adulterers and drunkards will receive their ultimate punishment in hell. That's what the Bible tells us. But they will also likely suffer a lot of negative consequences here on earth. For both of those sins, we can talk about lingering disease, we can talk about breakup of the family, we can talk about financial hardship. And so if you choose an extreme uh, life of sin on this earth, you will suffer the consequences here and later. So, so what is it when he talks about double portion? Is he talking about, okay, earth and hell, you're going to catch it in both, or he's going to say, when you get there, man, it's, it's going to be worse according to your sin. We, we don't know. We're not really told enough to land either way. But I kind of landed on this. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Both are horrible. Both are horrible. You don't want either one of those. And there seems to me to be a bit of a little bit of good news in this this last general principle, because it stands to reason that if extreme sin leads to extreme judgment, okay, whether it's here on earth or whether it all happens, to, if extreme sin leads to extreme judgment, it stands to reason that extreme righteousness might lead to extreme reward. So all Christians go to heaven 
based on their trust in what Jesus did for them on the cross. But there seem to be degrees of reward for those who excelled in righteous living on this earth. There's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that, that hint at that. Write these down. Ephesians 6, verses 7 and 8. Let me read it. Serve wholeheartedly. As if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he done. So there's a connection between serving wholeheartedly and receiving your reward. Uh, 2 John, verse 8. Watch out that you do not lose what you've worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. That's actually in the context of encouraging Christians, don't fall away, keep serving fully, because if you keep serving fully, you will be rewarded fully. Seems degree to me. Revelation chapter 11, verses 18, we, we looked at earlier, the second half of 18. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name. And some people look at that and say, there's three classes of reward. Prophets, saints, those who revere the name of God. Now, again, I don't know that the Bible gives us uh, definitive instruction on this, but it seems at least to be an indication that extreme righteousness leads to extreme reward in heaven. And if that's the case... I want to live my life today in a way that if it happens in heaven, I, I want to be able to experience that someday. Um, I thought of an example of that, and, and I'll close our lesson with that. When our kid, kids were little, um, you know, they would be sitting around the dinner table. We, we, we have our, our, our table here, and it's me and my wife and our three children, and, and the kids are there. Um, they, they really are sitting there uh, because I've allowed them to sit there, sit there there since they're in my family. They're sitting at my dinner table. They're my family. They're eating my food because they are in my family. That's why they're there. I have allowed them to be there. So they get the joys of eating at my table with my food. Now, once in a while, one of them would have done something extraordinarily good, okay? Maybe they excelled with something in school, or I, I noticed something happening. And so every once in a while, uh, all of them are on the table, but after table, I may go up to the one, and I may whisper in the ear, hey, come with me, come with me. And we'll sneak out of the house so nobody sees us, and we'll get in the car, and we will go get our own Dairy Queen Blizzard, and I tell them how proud I am of them. So everybody got a, to eat at the table. But at that moment, because of that reason, that child got ice cream too. Now, as Christians, we sit at the dinner table in heaven someday. And why are we there? Because the Father has allowed us, by the grace of his son Jesus, to be at his table and eat his food. But I want to live my life in a way that one day after dinner in heaven, Christ will rise from the table and walk over to me and whisper in my ear, hey, come with me. And just the two of us will walk over to the Dairy Queen in heaven. There is one there. They're all large blizzards. They have no calories. And the best thing about eating it is hearing Jesus tell you how proud he is of you because of something you did here. I don't know if that'll happen but there's hints that it might. And I want to live my life that way just in case. I hope you do too. See you next lesson when we jump into the 19th chapter. Thanks for being here.